In this presentation, I'm going to cover the value of using passive hours in projects and why it matters to deliver better buildings for occupants. I'm going to start off with the analogy that I have used many times in the past, asking why does it matter to have numbers shown on money bills? If I believe that George Washington was a better president than Benjamin Franklin, who was never a president, then I may believe that the money bill on the left is more valuable than the one on the right. And so I may ask or expect a trade for this. I give you a George Washington in exchange of a Benjamin Franklin, and it will be a great deal for me. Now, the reason we use, uh, we put numbers on money bills is to know that Benjamin Franklin is worth $100, whereas George Washington is $1. In other words, numbers help us every day to make informed decisions and help us navigate things where uh, our opinions cannot really uh, help us decide uh, the correct solution to move forward. Another question I ask frequently to the builders that come and take our training is, how long do you think a family stays in a house before they move out again? And the answer I receive time and times again is between five and seven years, maybe three years, maybe seven, maybe six. The reality is that family stays in the homes for about 13 years, according to data from the National Association of Home Builders. So uh, families stays in the homes two or three times longer than what most professionals believe. And so it is our duty as the professionals of the construction industry to base our information, feedback and work on actual data coming from the market. And that is what this presentation uh, uses to address the value of why we build buildings and why to use the science of passive house to improve them. Uh, so looking at the market, uh, we have <laughs> examples like this one. This is an example of me purchasing a laser level and turning it on, on the, uh, inside the apartment I used to live in, in Arvada, Colorado. And as you can tell uh, from that vertical laser line, the top of the wall is pretty close to that line, whereas the bottom of the wall is very off. And at the floor, the, uh, uh, the wall was about three quarter inch off plan. So this is something that builders is, are more used to looking in the buildings and looking at feedback of, of how uh, well or poorly things are built. There are things that, that, that are less evident uh, in buildings that do impact our life on a regular basis. Uh, this is the same building. I had ice forming on the window in my home office uh, on a regular basis. And that is a window that is maybe five years old and so that window is going to stay there and impact lives of people living in that place for decades to come. And I posted this uh, photo of the, of the ice forming on the edge of the window on LinkedIn, where because of what we do, we have a lot of um, uh, professionals from the fenestration industry. And a lot of the feedback I got was that ice is normal on the inside of the window. There's nothing wrong with ice. And I believe that we have very different, uh, a very different framework uh, as to, uh, for which we evaluate buildings. In my book, there should be no ice at all forming inside the windows. People should be comfortable. There should be no mold forming inside buildings. And that is something that building code and a lot of professionals have not caught up with yet. That the fact that we build buildings for people. Uh, this is another example from a brewery in Colorado. Uh, we had a, an EMU team meeting. We were having a beer. Uh, unfortunately, we, have, we were having a beer at a brewery where uh, the, they had garage doors uh, for the fenestration because in the summertime it's cool to open up the place to the exterior. Now, that is a very poor choice in terms of thermal comfort. The th infrared image at the bottom shows how cold it was on the interior face of the window. Uh, and so it resulted in bad business. I ended up having only one beer. I would have definitely had a second 
uh, had it been more comfortable and instead I just wanted to get out of, of there because it was very uncomfortable. So this comfort is bad business. Uh, as it is, uh, if you're working on your building and as a result your building fills, fills up with mold, that is not good. The picture on the right we use in our um, builder training to show how this building on the right hand side did not have any mold before uh, the retrofit and after the retrofit it filled up with mold and that was because the uh, they made renovation steps that caused uh, the building to be more airtight without addressing thermal bridging and ventilation uh, and more building science to it but the result of that energy retrofit was that the building was more energy efficient and less healthy to live in and that is not what we um, are called to do as building professionals. Lastly, uh, this graph shows the concentration of CO2 in my home office in the same apartment in Nevada I mentioned earlier. And that is something that uh, it is really little understood in buildings, but especially in the shorter season where the furnace was not working, there was just not enough air circulating, so I had very poor indoor air quality. So, as building professionals, let's ask ourselves, why do we do buildings in life? Like, buildings should suck less than the outside. If, if uh, we, mankind, have created buildings, is to have a shelter and have a place to live that is less miserable than just living outside. And now, if I have ice, discomfort, mold, and put into a quarter inside buildings, it may be better to live outside and not have buildings anyway. So we need, we need to design and construct buildings that are better than living outside. And all of these pictures that we see here is something that happened in the past five to 10 years. So this is extremely current in the construction industry. So the reason why we EMU came to Passive House uh, back in 2010 or whatever, was really uh, a way to find a benchmark um, and the science to <clears throat> make decisions back in the day when we were architects. And uh, the what we liked about the passive standard is, is it really focuses on the making the building better in terms of avoiding mold and condensation. Uh, is it okay to have mold and condensation in buildings? Apparently, for the financial industry, it is. But it, is, it shouldn't be the case, and building code is still far from adopting science-based design methods to prevent mold condensation uh, in buildings. We're going to see how Passive House has that today. We want to have high indoor air quality. Um, we, we don't want pollutants to accumulate inside the buildings, which is instead the norm. Uh, and we're going to see today how uh, it is not just enough to buy the expensive fresher ERV system, you also need to commission it properly uh, to actually receive the quality, something that Passive House does in the commissioning uh, requirement for the ERV system. And if you do a Passive House-like building, you may not do that and you don't get the indoor quality. We want to have thermal comfort. It needs to be more comfortable inside than it is outside. That is why we do buildings in the first place. We're gonna see how, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, how two windows, both with triple pane glass, one does achieve thermal comfort and one doesn't. Out of a lot of details that can go in the window specs, um, but just calling out a triple pane glass is not enough to actually get performance. Uh, durability, if you think about why we are we air sealing buildings, the one, the one word to convey that is we want buildings to be durable. That's why uh, passive house requires um, all buildings to pass a blower door test with an air changes per hour at 50 pascal ACH 50 of less than 0.6. If you do all of that, then your building become also a lot more energy efficient. Passive house has requirements in terms of maximum allowed heat in demand, uh, maximum allowed cooling demand, and primary energy renewable. I'm not going to get too much into that uh, because today's uh, presentation is really about why we do buildings uh, and what's the value that we provide um, to, to projects even if they are not pursuing certification. 
Uh, you want to think about passive house as a performance based group of metrics uh, that is based on uh, the whole building energy modeling. There is not a single checklist, so teams are, are free to choose from whatever construction methods they like and they're most comfortable with or whatever is most cost effective in their area uh, to set their own goals and the uh, passive house performance based approach allows them to do that without a checklist uh, to be filled. Uh, you want to think about passive house as a more advanced building code that set goals and allows you for a sophisticated uh, way to verify value points like absence of modern condensation, having thermal comfort, having durability, uh, in ways that are the state-of-the-art building science that the uh, regular building code is decades away from implementing. And if you do that, then your buildings meeting passive hours uh, require about 80% less heating and cooling than, regular, than the same building built just to meet the latest energy code, the 2021 IECC. Um, an example of this climate-specific optimization, this is um, some of, something that we're doing on our, on our consulting side. A couple of examples here, we have a project in Climate Zone 7, uh, form factor, yada, yada. Uh, we ended up specking triple pane windows because of uh, thermal comfort, having low gains glass, R60 walls and other details. Whereas to meet the same passive or standard in Clamazon 2, the specs were actually different with just double pane glass, low solar gains, uh, R20 walls and other details. So this is something that in order to achieve the same goal, you have uh, different uh, details that you need to implement in your project. This is important because the moment you uh, are okay and decide to invest more money in your project, there's plenty of people and companies out there helping you spending that money. Um, you just don't know if you're gonna get the value out of spending that money. So the performance-based approach and the reason we use numbers is to understand whether A is better than B and it's more important than C, or maybe B is a better option. So numbers are really important, numbers based on a analytical energy model, um, because uh, otherwise it's very difficult to make decisions and make, give recommendations to investors, developers, and clients uh, on how to spend their money, as simple as that. So we are working in a space where the minimum standard you can uh, build to is the local uh, building code. And on the other side of the spectrum, the better end is meeting passivos uh, for what we just saw. Now, in training builders, we see a lot of concepts um, circulating that are very confusing and difficult to understand. They include, oh, my building is better than code. My building is 20% better than code, based out of I don't know what. My building is high performance. Literally, if you have one eighth of an inch more insulation than code, and you still build like poorly, you can call the building high performance because you literally have a tiny bit more insulation than code. So it is higher than building code, but it doesn't mean it's uh, high performance. Uh, we are based out of Denver, Colorado. And if you walk north and go for a long time, at some point, you're going to get to Canada. Now, adding a quarter of an inch or just one inch more insulation than building code in most climate zones won't get, will not get you to passive house. We get a lot of projects doing tiny little improvements on how to make it better. And yes, they're better. But it's like from Denver, walking one mile north, you're closer to Canada. You're not close to Canada. So it's all relative. And there are so many of these uh, concepts in the construction industry that is, uh, we want to address that. Oh, my building is super insulated, it's super tight, zero utility, it's passive solar. It's basically passive, but we haven't done the modeling. So we call these concepts floaters in that they are in between code minimum and passive house. And it's risky for the parties involved because 
the expectations are very undefined and how do we define what success looks like? Uh, it's very risky because you end up over promising and under delivering. You may overpay for a window package that you don't need. You may under deliver. For example, we have an, you're going to see an example for indoor air quality where they installed uh, expensive ESB system for fresh air. They did not commission it. And now they are not getting the air quality that they pay for. Uh, we're going to see issues with moisture management as well as an overall lack of structure and, and guidance because without an actual goal, you don't actually know what you're doing. Uh, again, these are floaters that float in between a code minimum, which is a goal, it's a codified standard, and the other end of the spectrum is passive house, which is another uh, black and white standard, and you're floating in between, it's very difficult to have a structure uh, to define expectations and achieve success. So that is very risky uh, for construction professionals to do. Now, think about going to the hospital and you have a doctor visiting you, and they tell you, hey, it's broken. Okay. What if they tell you it's basically broken? It's better than broken. You would not take that language from a, from a doctor. You would not take the language from a hospital. Is it broken or is it not? Like, it's simple as that. And in the construction industry, we take a lot of these foggy, undefined words or concepts and we run with it. And we end up setting up an expectation that is undefined and that is impossible to meet. Uh, in fact, uh, we make promises to our clients and we need to deliver on them. And that is oftentimes very difficult to do if your promise is undefined. Uh, this study uh, shows the energy monitoring of 25 buildings built and occupied in the UK. In the salmon light, uh, lighter red, at the bottom of each column, you see the promise. That is, what the expectation was for the building, for how much energy the building would consume over a typical year. And in darker red, you see how much more the building ended up consuming um, because of a number of reasons. So we have a promise and we have an underdelivered. And that is called a performance gap, the gap between the, perf the performance that was expected and the performance that was delivered. Now you see that the performance gap in some of these buildings is significant because there's a lot, the building consumes a lot more energy than they had anticipated by design. You can also see on the right hand side of this graph that there are three passive house projects in the, uh, that, they, they, that they monitored uh, after being occupied. And the performance gap there is almost uh, non-existent. So passive house is a way to set up define expectations, uh, have a very thorough process to deliver them, and then meeting them. This is very important in order for uh, you to deliver a better product and your clients to actually receive what they pay for. So as, I, as I've done in the past, uh, I have a bonfire st fire story with um, Enrico and Enrique. If this is your first time uh, meeting them, this is Enrico. Enrico has an accent. Enrico is a total square when it comes to building science and he is contracted to build the passive house. Whereas Enrique, uh, his, Enrico's twin brother, also has an accent. Googles a lot, but it doesn't, he doesn't do energy modeling and is contracted to do a passive house like house. Now, uh, this is, I don't know, the fourth or fifth presentation I give about Enrico and Enrique. Uh, I've given presentations uh, for them in Texas, in Nevada, uh, Las Vegas. Uh, and this uh, presentation today is for uh, Cyber Spring, Maryland. Uh, where I just gave this presentation for the local building science and beer. So if you're interested in warmer climates, uh, look us up on YouTube. You're going to find other videos for Vegas and for Texas. If you're interested in colder climate zone, uh, stay tuned because we have more coming out for Denver, Chicago, Minnesota, and for a colder and harsher climate zone. But anyway, this is an example of how the same project 
Uh, so Enrico and Enrique are building and designing the same identical building. They're just going to make different decisions along the way uh, to fulfill the client expectation. And as I mentioned, uh, this is my house project in uh, Tabernash, Colorado. And I moved the project to Silver Spring, Maryland to see how, how that would perform. So starting off on the floor, um, I want to get R15. Um, Enrico chooses 4-inch EPS under slab, whereas Enrico uh, uses 3-inch of XPS. Then um, for the walls, we have R30 requirements. So Enrico uses dense back cellulose in the stunt cavity and 2 inches of continuous insulation exterior to the sheeting, whereas Enrique uses the same dense back cellulose uh, to get to R20 in the stunt cavity and then two and a half or zip R sheet where actually two inches of that is polyiso to get to the same R12. Then for the roof, um, Enrico uses 15 inch of dense black fiberglass uh, on the underside of the roof deck, uh, whereas Enrico uses uh, eight and a half inch of, of closed cell spray foam to get to the same R60 uh, for the roof. For windows, <coughs> excuse me, Enrico uses a passive house C grade frame. We don't really have the time to address what that means, but shoot me an email and I can talk your, your ears off of that. Uh, warm at spaces, um, beefy triple pane, inch and inch, well, 1.8, almost two inches overall thickness of the glass unit. We're gonna see what that means in a sec. Uh, Enrico uses to have argon fill, 90% argon fill. Uh, to improve the performance uh, of the glass unit because argon insulates better than air. Now, 90% is uh, the maximum that the industry can deliver these days. If you see 100% argon fill, that's a lie. There's no technology today to guarantee that your glass unit is going to be 100% filled with gas. Uh, then for the solar heat gain coefficient, SHGC, uh, so the, co the low E coating on the glass, uh, and Enrico chooses coatings that would get 0.35 SHGC, meaning that 35% of the energy coming in from the sun will actually go through the glass and get into the building. And that helps reducing the need for heating um, in the wintertime. Keep in mind the Silver Spring uh, many landings in climate zone 4, uh, 4A. And as far as the where to install the window, and they could choose to put the window in the middle of the wall, as this uh, little uh, section drawing here shows. It's like the ex exterior face of the window is actually lined up uh, with the exterior face of the sheeting. Then Enrique also chooses a triple pane glass uh, with C-grade frame and wall match spacer. But the triple pane that Enrique uses is what we at EMU call skinny. Beefy and skinny is language that we EMU have come up with uh, to help build and understand the difference. It comes down to the overall thickness, O slash A means overall, thickness of the glass unit assembly. And while Enrique's window on the right hand side has a triple pane glass, the overall thickness is about half of what Enrico is using, 1.8 versus just one inch overall thickness. And that is going to make a difference. We're going to see. Then um, uh, Enrique found online that argon escapes only after a few years. So he chooses uh, to, uh, to fill the glass with, just with air and not do argon because the performance is going to go away anyway. So why bother? And for solar heat gain coefficient, Enrique uses a low gains class, 0.2 uh, SAGC, meaning that only 20% of the energy comes in uh, instead of 35% of Enrico. Um, and that is because Enrique is concerned about the building overheating in the summertime. Um, and lastly, uh, as the section drawing shows, Enrique chooses to install the window all the way to the exterior in a more traditional Audi window install detail. We're going to see how all of this impacts. And you can tell how important windows are because there's a lot of details that go into choosing a window um, and how to install it. And windows are very expensive. So this is a very big, important part of making 
a high performance project uh, whether or not you want to achieve fast survives. Then for fresh air systems with heat recovery, HRV and ERVs, um, Enrico uses a ducted centralized ERV with 87% heat recovery, whereas Enrique uh, uses a ductless decentralized room only um, ventilation system with 89% heat recovery. We're going to see how these two play out and compare them to each other. For air barrier, they both want to meet 0.6 air changes per hour. So Enrico details his building so that starting from the ground up, the slab has the poly polyethylene poly um, vapor retardant membrane taped to those seams to become the air barrier. Uh, at the walls, Enrico uses the sheeting boards um, and seals them together um, to become the air barrier. And then the, at the ceiling, uh, he uses a smart the membrane uh, for the air barrier. For Enrique, on the other hand, uh, we have the same tape poly membrane at the slab. For the walls, um, Enrico, Enrique uses the drywall as the air barrier. And at the ceiling, uh, as we saw, Enrique uses the spray foam, the closed cell spray foam, so that is his air barrier. In addition to that, Enrique really wants to outperform Enrico, so he uses aero barrier uh, down to uh, 0.6 air changes per hour. Uh, if you don't know what aero barrier is, aero barrier is a product that um, consists of um, pressurizing the building, so the building is run at positive pressure, uh, and they nebulize a caulking agent that goes and finds the leaks and clogs them as a way to um, air seal the building. We're going to see how that uh, plays out for the air sealing of the building. But if you, if you are not familiar with aero barrier, is as I said, a caulking agent that gets nebulized uh, into the building and the positive pressure they run the building during their operation forces the caulking agent to go find the leaks and seal them. It's time to build. Uh, we do the blower door test. Uh, Enrico gets to 0.6. Uh, Enrico gets to also 0.6. So we get we hit the finish line. Uh, we meet the client expectations, and uh, we hit the indoor quality. We have thermal comfort. Moisture is under control. We get the energy efficiency. It feels good. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Puppies and kittens and so on. And everybody's happy until we're not. Uh, all of a sudden, Enrique's building starts to consume a lot more energy than the, we had expected. And this is very uh, troublesome for the client that paid for the aero barrier, for, paid for the triple pane windows, paid for the HRVs, paid for the zip R, all these, all these products that the client uh, agreed to pay for, and they're not getting the, the performance. We're going to see why. Starting off, with condensation because and something happened and now Enrique's client has condensation um, in his building as well as it's very uncomfortable and we're gonna see why. So um, starting from the C word which in, in construction is condensation, uh, ask yourself do you know how much water vapor does a family of four produces on a daily basis? Is it a pint? Is it an ounce? Is it a gallon? Do you know? It's actually two and a half gallons of water vapor per day. That is how much moisture a family of four produces. We are used to living in very leaky buildings where that moisture goes away. Now the buildings are becoming more airtight and that is a very good thing that moisture has to go somewhere and even in the most vapor open straw bale with clay plaster and lime plaster even the most vapor open assembly that is not enough for that two and a half gallons of water vapor to go out every day we need to vent buildings properly and uh, this means that the conditions inside our buildings are different uh, in, in these airtight buildings are different than 
uh, from what we are used to. Now, for the install of Windows, Enrique chose to have a metal seal pan under the windows and doors uh, to get any water, uh, to drain any water out. And this results in uh, a very, very big thermal bridge. You see on the right hand side how the isotherms are very disturbed. The isotherms are the black line uh, running across the rainbow, so to, so to, or along the rainbow. And whenever you see them fanning out uh, as, uh, as they do where the orange arrow is pointing towards, uh, that is not good. You want your isotherms to run nice and easy along your um, rainbow. And what, we, what the orange arrow here is pointing towards is where they open up because of the thermal bridge caused, the, caused by the very thin sheet of metal that Enrique installed under the uh, windows and doors, which results in a temperature factor, factor FRSI, uh, there's a typo there, it should be FRSI, sorry about that, of 0 0.45. What does that mean? It, the, the temperature factor is a way that Passivus has a way uh, to calculate the risk of molding condensation. Uh, whereas Enrico used uh, tape flushing for the same detail, and tape does not cause thermal bridging, as you can see on, on Enrico's isotherms on the right hand side of the slide, where the isotherms run along the rainbow very nicely and this results in the, t the temperature of the coldest spot being much higher, almost 20 degrees higher for Enrico for the same detail than Enrique. Uh, in passive house, we call this approach the hygiene requirement of passive house, which is uh, by calculating the temperature factors uh, by design, you can eliminate the risk of mold condensation. And this is just one example of the uh, science of passive house and the uh, value of these numbers that we use in the modeling that building code is decades, decades away from implementing. And if you are a floater in between passive house and code minimum, uh, you oftentimes don't do this and you don't have, uh, you don't bring this value uh, to projects. Uh, discomfort is the second big step uh, for Enrique's client. Again, the energy efficiency is something that um, clients are interested in, uh, but if you have ability that is uncomfortable, moldy, and has a lot of condensation, that is something that a client is going to be very unhappy about. And Enrique's client is someone that paid for triple pane windows, paid for exterior insulation, paid for the HRV, paid for all the toys, and did not get the, the performance. Now, in case of discomfort, we talked about all of the different details that Enrico and Enrique spec for the windows, and this is the consequence. Um, we're going to see the consequence about that. Starting off from beefy triple pane for Enrico, uh, 1.8 inch uh, glass. We're going to see in just a sec what that, what that means. Whereas Enrique uh, has a much skinnier triple pane glass, but much narrower glass, overall glass unit. Enrico is argon filled, with, whereas Enrique only has just as hair. They both have low E coating. Um, Enrico has an INI install, uh, so the Enrico's window is lined up in the middle of the wall, whereas Enrique is, uh, is Enrique's window is installed all the way to the outside. And that results in a temperature delta between the room, tempe the room average temperature for Enrico uh, and the, I'm sorry, all of these details result in a temperature delta between the uh, surface temp temperature on the inside of the window average and the room. So the window, the delta between the room and the window for Enrico is 4.2 degrees, whereas for Enrico is almost five times higher delta, uh, about 21 degrees. Uh, the wind is about 21 degrees colder uh, than uh, the room. So Enrique's client can definitely uh, perceive that. And there's a science behind this where that tells us 
if the delta is less than 7.6 degrees, as in Enrico's case on the left, then you cannot feel the difference. And every surface seems to be the same temperature, so you are comfortable. Whereas if the, your, the delta in the colder area, like the window, is greater than 7.6, then you do feel the difference and you're going to be uncomfortable. Even if your room is at uh, 72 or 74, you can crank up the heating, but your delta is still going to be there. Um, and so you're going to be uncomfortable. So Enrique picked triple pane windows, but they are really underperforming, um, resulting in discomfort. Um, looking at the exterior walls, um, Enrique chose the uh, zip R sheeting, which is a sheeting. Uh, this is an area, uh, high performance buildings, are the higher the performance, the more critical every detail it becomes um, and uh, the closer you get to zero energy consumption in building the more every single detail matters now this image shows the uh, 3d thermal bridge model of the wall using zip r uh, and you see the little red dots uh, they look like pimples those are the fasteners per the zip r nailing spec and you know, steel conducts heat 1200 times better than insulation. Uh, so the, those little nails become little highways for heat to escape. And, you, and those degrade your R value. And because zip R is a sheeting, it gets a lot more fasteners than a regular insulation board. Insulation board would have one fastener every 12 inches or uh, 16 inches vertically. Whereas uh, you see here how many nails you need uh, for the uh, for the nailing uh, specs. And all of this degrades um, the R value that you get uh, from that insulation compared to having the same nominal R value applied outboard of the sheeting and now you need a lot less fasteners. Then looking at the roof, um, Enrique uh, designed his roof assuming the um, 7 R per inch R value for spray foam. But the reality is that spray foam is a very difficult product to install properly on site because uh, the chemical reaction that has to happen on site uh, properly requires a certain set of temperature, uh, relative humidity and time for that chemical reaction to occur properly. I have seen uh, specimen, uh, um, closer spray foam specimen uh, from a lab and they look pristine and perfect. But in the field, it's very difficult to have those conditions and the, the install quality uh, matters a ton. In fact, in Europe, you can see this, the German standard DIN 4108-4 uh, specs the uh, standard uh, R value, R per inch value of uh, closed cell spray foam if site applied to 3.6 instead of 7. So it is you get you can have as low as half uh, the R value than you get on a spec sheet because the, sp the specimens the spec sheet is based upon were tested in a lab, not in the field. So that is very critical. And Enrico, Enrique pays a big penalty here. Uh, looking at the triple pane, beefy and skinny, the two, uh, the two orange arrows on the left show what we mean by thickness, the overall O-A thickness of the glass unit. Beefy and skinny uh, is language that we emu uh, have come up with uh, to teach builders the difference, you know, if you have a beefier glass or a skinnier glass, you know. At the end of the day, the glass pane themselves don't contribute almost any anything to the performance of the glass. They are just there to uh, keep the wind out and keep the, the pocket uh, of the gas and close and insulated, uh, but themselves don't uh, provide insulation. Now, uh, Looking at day one performance, a, a skinny triple pane glass with only one inch uh, of overall thickness with air fill 
has a central blast resistance of about uh, R4.7, R5. Whereas the beefy triple pane with argon fill is about twice as much. So they are both triple pane. The R value that you get uh, from the um, from the beefier triple pane with argon uh, is twice as much. And the um, the this is I cannot. Uh, it would take some longer time than I have today to tell which part is driven by the argon fill and which part is driven by the fact that 1.8 is more of a gap uh, than uh, the skinnier glass. So this is, I would need uh, probably an hour long presentation to go over those. But just taking for what it is, both Enrico and Enrico got triple pane glass and one got twice the R value literally than the other. Uh, this is the um, graph showing. This graph shows the um, temperatures in Silver Spring, Maryland, and um, the yellow line at the bottom is the how the American Association rates uh, the performance of glass, uh, the conditions that the glass is rated at for NFRC, whereas the orange line shows the rating conditions. Uh, for the European standard. And uh, the European standard uh, it is more relevant for the conditions of Maryland. Uh, in fact, it is more relevant for the conditions of most of the country. Uh, and this causes the uh, industry, and it causes the American manufacturers to have very skinny glass that underperforms in regular conditions because those conditions are not met. This is worth for a follow up. Uh, presentations that I'm going to put together at some point in life, uh, but um, there are some reasons behind this. Long story short, they both got triple pain, um, and one is getting twice as much the R value than the other. Uh, solar heat gain coefficient describes the amount of energy that the uh, glass allows through the, uh, sorry, that the coating allows through the glass. The two Pictures on the left show the dashed line, yellow at the top and the red dash at the bottom, uh, where the low E coatings are. And low E coatings are metal oxides that are applied to the inside of the glass to reduce losses. And in reducing losses, they also reduce the amount of uh, passive solar gains that come through the glass. And that is something that is very important to determine for your project, uh, whether it is a hotel, office building, school, home. And that is something that is really important to do with the basis of an energy model uh, to determine what is the best coating to apply to your glass for your climate um, for the year round performance. Now the same glass, you're not gonna go around and change your type of glass in summertime versus winter. So once you choose the type of glass, it's pretty much there for the rest of the life of that window or door. Now, Enrico at the top had the energy modeling done and uh, chose a medium solar gain glass with a, a solar heat gain coefficient SAGC of 35%, that is 0.35 SAGC, which means that it allows 35% of the total energy coming from the sun in, which includes daylight, heat, um, and others. Whereas Enrique uh, chose a lower uh, solar heat gain coefficient with only 20% of the total energy coming in. Uh, the reason why um, Enrico chose the medium glass is because Maryland is still more heating dominated than it is cooling dominated. So having the glass allowing some more passive solar gains in allows to reduce the need for heating. Of course, it's a compromise because on the other side, it also increases the need for cooling because you're letting in more sun uh, in the summertime. Now this leads, to, um, but as the graph shows on the right hand side, shows that for the, the project that is my house from Colorado moved to uh, Silver Spring, it's still more beneficial to have some more passive solar gains in the overall uh, because Enrique choosing lower gains saves about 10% of the cooling but it also has about 20% more heating. So uh, his 
energy bill goes up because it has lower solar gains. So this is something that you cannot really eyeball, period. <laughs> this is something that you need to have an energy model uh, to make this kind of informed decision, otherwise you're just guessing. Uh, when it comes to fresh air ventilation, we saw how Enrico chose uh, a ducted um, HRV uh, centralized, whereas Enrique here uh, chose a, a single room ductless ventilation unit. And this is this was because on paper uh, this company has um, a rating from a German uh, standard showing up to 89% uh, heat recovery. Now, uh, unfortunately, this, this German standard they are using for that rating is very inaccurate in that uh, it does not account, for example, for the energy consumption of fans uh, or the fact that uh, the system works intermittently. Um, so it's the, even though there's a German certificate for them, it's very uh, inaccurate. And some Italians love to point it out. That would be Enrico. Uh, oh, sorry. So the actual performance that th these units deliver is much lower than the label value, and Enrique, Enrique pays the penalty uh, for this in the overall building energy consumption. So when you're choosing products for your clients, it's very important to have realistic expectations about what a system can deliver or not. Uh, what about indoor air quality? I just mentioned um, that Enrico chose to have uh, a centralized ventilation system. Uh, this is something that actually came up in the in a lunch conversation at the Building Science and Beer um, event in Chattanooga, which I'm very uh, thankful to have participated in. Uh, we want to prevent mold and condensation, so that, that's why we have uh, uh, expensive or fancy fresh air ventilation system, which in my opinion are totally worth it, uh, but this system needs to be commissioned properly to work properly. In other words, there needs to be someone that by design specs out the ventilation rates and someone in the field need to make sure that those ventilation rates actually happen. Uh, air is lazy um, and uh, if you are supplying fresh air to two bedrooms, for example, say 20 cubic feet per minute each, um, by design, uh, don't expect to install the system and to receive those 20 CFM uh, right off the bat. The air is lazy, so the air is going to go uh, through the path of least resistance to the bedroom that is closest uh, to the uh, HIV, and the bedroom that is further away will get little or no airflow. That's why it is a requirement for passive house for the system to be commissioned uh, to work properly and to actually deliver indoor air quality. There was a study in Colorado monitoring the indoor air quality uh, in passive house-like projects. There was not, not that many certified passive house buildings in Colorado at that time. And what the study showed that for the one uh, passive house, the air quality was pretty good. And for the passive house-like project, the air quality was 50-50. Some of them, the air quality was great. Some of them, the, the air quality was pretty bad uh, because the systems were not commissioned. In fact, uh, oftentimes uh, installers of this system charge more if, um, if you're asking for a commissioning as if the project was to go for a passive house certification. Meaning that in a regular uh, commissioning, uh, they don't commission it as deep in a, as detailed manner, and so you have the risk, uh, if you don't follow passive house, you, you have the risk uh, to have to buy the equipment and not get the indoor air quality that you're paying for. Again, think about the value that you're trying to deliver, you really want to deliver that value. Now, we talked about how an American family stays in a house for 13 years, so let's see how this performance ages over a 13-year lifespan. Uh, we talked about the gas inside the glass unit. Um, Enrico um, has glass units that are filled with gas. And Enrique heard online that um, the gas goes away only uh, after a few years, so why bother? 
These graphs here show the change in performance to be expected um, from glass units um, over 13 years of aging. So on the left we have Enrique's uh, glass units that have air, so they have nothing to lose. Uh, so from 4.7 center of glass R value day one, uh, they keep it because there's nothing to lose there and it stays at 4.7 um, R value center of glass. Whereas Enrico on the right hand side started off with 90% fill of argon at day one resulting in 9.8 center of glass R value. Uh, and over 13 years of time, you can expect 1% of gas loss per year. Mean that from a starting gas fill of 90%, you um, go down 13% over 13 years, uh, down to 77% uh, after 13 years. So that results in the R value going down from 9.8 to 9.4. Still greatly outperforms Enrique's uh, performance here. So this is something that, that we hear over and over in the field, um, but argon fill is very worth it. It requires care, especially if you're working with buildings at, at elevation, uh, but it's definitely uh, worthwhile uh, to do if done properly. Floor insulation, um, sorry, uh, we talked about XPS. XPS starts off with five R per inch. Um, we actually use 4.1 in our modeling because over time, uh, the XPS loses its expanding agent, uh, so it loses some performance because um, the expanding agent inside the board uh, is the gas that delivers a, a better performance, so to get that a, a 5 R per inch. Uh, so Enrique here loses some R value just because uh, the XPS board degasses um, and so it loses some R value. Then uh, we talked about the blower door test and we talked about how Enrico you, uh, used the um, poly at the, at the floor, used the sheeting at the, um, at the walls and the smart paper at the ceiling, whereas Enrique, as shown here, wanted to hit 0.6. So Enrique went above and beyond and also used aero barrier uh, to air seal the building. To really hit that 0.6. Now at day one they both hit 0.6 air changes per hour at day one. Now if you're not familiar with aero barrier, uh, I described it briefly earlier, but their process uh, requires a lot of protection uh, on finishes such as windows and doors inside buildings, as well as if you have any ducts or HVAC equipment, all of that needs to be masked and protected uh, during the test. So um, if, the, if you get a certificate from Aero Barrier uh, that say that, oh, your building is now at 0.6, you still have a lot of masking to be removed, which that masking, meaning like masking tape, uh, plastic sheets to protect your equipment and your windows, uh, that, those, that masking does provide some additional air seal. So if you have 0.6 as the result of the aero barrier process, once you remove all the masking, your ACH50 number is going to go up. We've seen this on a few projects we had in the past. There's nothing wrong with the product. It's just the expectation that uh, if you're expecting to have an uh, aero barrier test resulting in 0.6, and from that you expect your final blower door test to also hit 0.6, you're going to be disappointed. Your, your blower door test is going to go up. We had projects where the aero uh, um, result was 0.13, and once they moved the masking, the blower door test went up to about, to about 40, 0.49. So just for you, it's a great product. Uh, it's a game changer for building retrofits, but it is, um, it's not the final test. You do need to have a final test for the final certification or to actually compare to other projects. And the test that Aerobeta gives you is not the final test. So the, those numbers are misleading. 
um, and this graph shows how much the test may go up. Um, so day one and the Enriquez project are the same. Day two, masking comes off off of um, Enriquez project and Enriquez um, uh, air leakage goes up. Now, what happens over 13 years or over a long time? Uh, luckily, we do have a history of passive house buildings being built for decades. Um, and we had the very first passive house in Darmstadt, Germany, that uh, was about 0.24 air changes per hour at day one. And they tested the, the building again after 25 years. Uh, and that building was at the same air tightness level of about 0.25 to 0.3. Uh, so this is something that if spec'd and executed properly can last for decades to come. It's not just for day one um, to pass code or to get glory or to get a badge. Now, uh, this graph shows that uh, over 13 years, uh, you can expect buildings to be more leaky. Um, and these numbers here are based on the sources I list, list in, the, in the graph itself. So Enrico chose to have the polymembrane under the slab, the sheeting taped at all seams, as well as the uh, air barrier membrane at the ceiling. And that does become a little bit more leaky over time. Uh, but as the data from existing building shows, it's not too bad. Uh, whereas Enrique not only had the air barrier, uh, day two incident, but also uh, chose the uh, drywall to be to be the air barrier of his walls, and drywall used as the air barrier is not very durable. Uh, data sh shows how uh, drywall as the air barrier becomes leakier four times faster than uh, other types of product. Uh, so that was a poor choice. Um, drywall is a poor choice. Uh, if you're trying your building to be durably airtight. And this, all of those uh, factors compound together caused uh, Enrique, Enrique's building to consume almost twice as much over time uh, compared to what the expectation was. Enrico's project performance does age over time, but that's negligible uh, compared to Enrique. Uh, so to conclude, the closer we get to zero energy consumption in building, the more every detail matter. Whatever your project goes, whether it is to be passive or certified or not, performance-based energy modeling allows you to make science-based informed decisions for your clients. Uh, and that is very important, whichever your goals are. Then today, the passive or science provides methods to deliver comfort, prevent more decondensation and to actually deliver energy efficiency that the regular building code is decades away from adopting. Uh, thank you for attention. We are EMU Passive. We are really passionate about passive house and making buildings um, better by means of uh, better science and better construction practices. Uh, thank you for attention and please leave uh, comments if you have any and reach out if you have questions.